This tutorial video will explain how to use the very basic features of Fiji to open images acquired on a microscope, to make basic adjustments to those images, and to get from the raw data uh, that comes out of the microscope images that you can then embed into a presentation or a Word document uh, or as part of a paper. Um, so the first thing is how do you get Fiji if you don't have it? Um, you can go to the Fiji website, which is Fiji.sc, and then download the version that's appropriate for you. I have Windows 64-bit, so that's what I clicked on, but there are a bunch of other options here. And if you click on more downloads, you'll get further information on um, different versions that you can download, as well as where you should and shouldn't install it, for example, if you're on Windows. Uh, once you select a version to download, you'll get something like this, which is just uh, a .zip of uh, the Fiji application. And, and all you need to do is right click on this if you're on a PC uh, and say extract all. And this will unzip those files into a folder um, that you can then put wherever you want and run it from there. Uh, so the whatever you want does have one small caveat, which is in Windows in particular, uh, you want to put it in your user space, uh, which means uh, in a position like this, so C, users, P-A-R-I-E-L is my particular user on my particular computer, you would use yours. Uh, you don't really want to put it inside C program files, which is where most other things go. And the reason is if you put it there, it has trouble updating. Um, so we're going to follow um, the instructions uh, for Fiji as they are online. And I'm going to put um, this folder in, uh, in my uh, user space. Um, so one other thing that I should note is Fiji uh, is constantly updated. And so the particular version that you're going to see this video with is uh, the version that's available today, uh, May 9th of 2022. So you can see um, this is what it unzipped, and then it has this app folder. And in this app folder, if you double click here, you'll be able to run Fiji. Now, I don't want to run it from the downloads folder. What I want to do is put it somewhere more logical, which as I said before, if you're on a PC, you want to go to C, users, uh, and your username. Uh, I've created a folder within my user space called Fiji in today's date, just to keep track, because I have other versions of Fiji on my computer. Uh, so I'm just going to put that there very quickly. <clears throat> and then uh, we can start the software by double clicking on this image J icon. And the reason, uh, if you have some confusion about what Fiji is and what image J is, Fiji is, you can think of it as a version of image J that has a bunch of useful plugins, including ones you will use today to open uh, microscope images during this tutorial. So I'm just going to double click where it says image J Win 6. You can see the Fiji logo coming on up. I'm going to close some of this stuff. These are the data files that we are going to use as a demonstration. And so you can see uh, Fiji started up. Uh, one thing that's important is if you want to update Fiji, uh, you should be aware of how to do that, which is if you go to help and say update, you click there, uh, it'll show you something like this where it's sort of checking and it says a bunch of stuff that's sort of more or less comprehensible here, uh, sort of checking various sites uh, with different components that are part of Fiji. And if you want, you can see the gory details of what it's checking here. So it'll check a bunch of things. And then if there are upgrades available uh, or updates available, it will let you uh, apply them. So I'll go through one cycle of this just so you can see what it looks like. Um, you'll be able to see that um, there'll be a list at the end of things that it wants to update, or maybe not, because I downloaded this uh, literally just a few minutes ago. Uh, there might not be anything uh, ready to be updated. So let's see. Um, OK, so you can see there are a few plugins that it wants to update and something that it wants to install. So if we say Apply Changes, it will download what it needs to download, update it successfully, and please restart ImageJ. So we can say OK. We'll close this and we will restart it. So that is here. You can see this is the version that we just installed. It's in um, my user space. I put it in a folder with today's date. Let's run it again.
command, uh, here we have an updated version of ImageJ. So if we were to run the updater again, uh, which I'm not going to do right now, you'll see that uh, if you do that after immediately updating, there's not going to be any more updates uh, that need to be um, taken care of. Okay, so that's how uh, you install Fiji and open it and update it. Uh, let's move on to how you um, open and make some basic manipulations of uh, typical images uh, that you might get from a microscope. And so what I have as stand-ins for typical images that you might get from a microscope are these six images that were acquired on uh, a Zeiss LSM uh, 700, I believe, confocal in my core facility. Um, and they were saved as .cci files. That's uh, the sort of more, more common Zeiss format. And so these files can be opened in a number of ways. They can be opened in uh, one of uh, the Zen versions, uh, and I'll explain that later at the end. So Zeiss has something called Zen Lite, which is a software that will open its images, and you can get sort of two versions bundled from Zeiss for free. Uh, it's called Zen Black and Zen Blue. Uh, you could open this in uh, Imaris Viewer, for which I have an independent tutorial uh, on this sort of YouTube uh, site for our core facility. And you can open it in Fiji, which is the, the topic for today. Uh, and there are other options as well, but maybe the four that I've just mentioned are the ones that are the most common. Um, so let's open it in Fiji, which has a number of things that make it extremely flexible and powerful, and you should really uh, get to know the very basics, at least, of this software. So to open things, th there's various ways you can do it. The easiest is you can just grab this uh, image that you want to open, and you drag it to the menu bar of Fiji right there. Be careful, don't miss and move it to the desktop, or rather copy it to the desktop. So if you release there, Fiji will realize uh, that that image uh, was a .czi. So it doesn't, uh, Fiji by itself can't just open anything. It has this uh, opener uh, thing called bioformats, uh, which is something that uh, a bunch of uh, folks wrote to be able to interpret many different microscopy uh, images formats. And this opener um, allows you to open uh, that image with a number of options which are here. So there's there's things that are related to whether you want to see the metadata, so uh, data about how that data was acquired, whether you want to see that. So you can click on that. You can specify whether you want to uh, manage the memory or just open a subset or crop the image when you open it. So if, for example, you have something very large like light sheet data, you might want to use a virtual stack or if you're working with a laptop that doesn't have a lot of RAM. Uh, you might want to organize the data set and uh, swap dimensions or concatenate series if that's applicable. Uh, you might want to open and immediately split channels, for example. So if it's a multi-channel image, you might want to open it uh, and split things apart. Uh, you can see that the only thing that's uh, um, clicked right now is this auto scale option, and that'll do exactly what it sounds like, which is when it opens it, it will uh, fiddle with the display settings to try and make it immediately visible. Now, the nice thing, in addition to all these options, is that if you hover over them to the right, there's an explanation of what that option means. So it's it's already, it may seem weird that you, you try and uh, drag something in and, and already you have to make all sorts of decisions, but it's actually very useful. Uh, and again, it, it points to the sort of, it, it illustrates the flexibility of the software. So if I say, okay, <clears throat> Uh, sometimes you get, you know, weird messages that you can ignore uh, safely. So you can see um, it opened it and it says that's the, the title bar. It says image1.czi. And then there's already a bunch of really useful stuff that's here. So you can see it says C124, Z, as in zebra, 1 to 18. Um, then over here, it says 75.58 by, uh, excuse me, 72.58 by 72.58 microns, 512 by 512, 16-bit, 36 megabytes. So this gives you a lot of information already about the image. So it tells you that it is a four-channel image. That's what C1 to 4 means. It means that you're on channel 1 out of 4. Z, 1 to 18, means it's a Z stack. So it's a set of images that were acquired um, at different Z planes. And we're looking at Z plane number 1 out of a total of 18. This tells you the uh, size in the sample that the image represents. So this image, which is 512 by 100, 512 pixels, represents 
about 73 by 73 microns in the sample. Uh, then this tells you what kind of image it is. It's a 16-bit image. We'll go into that a little bit later. And then um, it, it's an image that takes up 36 megabytes of memory. Okay. All right. So, but we can't see anything. So, so why is that? So, so let's look at this a little bit, uh, a little bit more. So you can see, uh, in addition to all this information, well, there's this black square, which or presumably there should have been something, but there's nothing there. Uh, and there's two sliders. So one says C. So if we change this, these will be the different channels. Now we still can't see anything. And this is Z. So this is the Z plane that we're looking at. So if we move here, you can see, oh, well, suddenly something, there is something in the middle in this channel and in this channel and in this channel and in this channel. Um, and you can, for example, move through the different channels, uh, excuse me, through the different Z planes of a given channel by moving this Z slider. Okay, um, but why, why do these things look gray? Uh, didn't we acquire different fluorophores? So indeed we did, uh, but there are uh, different ways in which the data can be displayed. And in, in you know, fresh out of the box, let's say, Fiji uh, evidently does it on a grayscale. So whenever you're trying to look at an image and adjust how it looks, uh, which is what we're going to go into next, there, especially if it's a multidimensional image, there, there are really two, um, two things that you want open together with the image. So let me minimize this. Let me make the image bigger with this uh, magnifying glass tool. So you can see I can make it a little bit bigger. Uh, and I'm going to open two kind of control elements that are very useful uh, when you're just trying to adjust how an image looks. And so those are going to be, if you go to image, adjust, brightness and contrast, which we can also get with control shift C. And then we're going to open image, color, channels tool, which you can also get with control shift Z. I'm going to open that as well. All right. So. Um, let's look at this a little bit, and we'll start with the Channels tool. So the Channels tool allows you to switch between channels by clicking on the channel number. And so you can see that when I do that, this bar also moves. Okay. In addition, it also has other display modes. Uh, so we were in grayscale, we can switch to the color display mode. And when we're in the color display mode, you can see that these things are in different colors. Now, maybe not the colors that we would want, but they are in some sort of color. And then uh, you can see that there are different ways of comp making composite images where the colors are blended together. Uh, unfortunately, this is something that's kind of under active development in the ImageJ slash Fiji community right now. And so this is actually kind of confusing. It used to be that there was only one of these called composite. And I believe in the newer version that's going to come out soon, that is also the case. And some of these other ones have been relegated um, to kind of a, a lower on this um, on this list of, of options. But if you do find uh, that you're looking at a version of Fiji where this looks like this, where there's multiple versions of composite, just use composite sum. Okay, if you want to see multiple channels merged. Now, before we go to that. Um, one of the things that we would probably like to do is change the colors of these channels, uh, because you know it, it, I don't know that I, uh, that I like the, the the colors that it that Fiji has selected. So sometimes Fiji respects what comes in the image, and sometimes it just makes it red, green, blue, and white. And I believe that's what it's done here, but that's not a good choice for this particular image. Uh, the reason being. Uh, in this image, uh, we acquired channel one was a far red channel, channel two was a red channel, channel three was a uh, green floor four channel, and channel four was a blue floor four channel. So a more typical representation for this would be white, red, green, blue, or you know some uh, colorblind friendlier version of that, like uh, white, magenta, yellow, and cyan. Uh, now, just be aware that when you have more than three colors, there's really no uh, optimal solution to how do you, dis you display more than three colors at the same time because uh, one of the four is going to overlap. But in any case, I'm just going to use, uh, I'll call channel one white. So how do I do that? So I click on channel one and I go here to more and I select whichever color I want, which is going to be grays. Then I go to channel two. This one I wanted to make red. I'm going to go to channel three. This one I wanted to make 
uh, green. And actually, rather than red and green, why don't I do something? Since I said the colorblind thing, let's make it color colorblind friendly. Let's make it magenta. Let's make this instead of green, yellow. And let's make this, which is uh, a dappy stain, which stains nuclei. Let's make this instead of blue, cyan. Okay, so now we have uh, multiple uh, colors. And if we go to composite sum, we can see how different things are overlaid. So I'm going to remove channel one and just focus on the other channels. And you can see, okay, that's channel four in combination with three or in combination with two or in combination with one. Um, and you, you quickly are noticing, I imagine, that things don't look very bright. They're kind of hard to see. So I am going to switch back to grayscale where things can be a little bit simpler to see. And now we're going to start discussing how we adjust the brightness and the contrast of the image. So how do we adjust how this looks? And so before we get into the nitty gritty of how to adjust how uh, this looks, I wanna make the distinction that we are really just adjusting how this image is going to look, but we are not changing the data in the image. And so this requires a bit more explanation. So if you take, again, this magnifying glass and zoom into the image, you can see that the image is made out of these little squares, which are called pixels. And so these pixels uh, represent, they don't represent squares in the original sample, they represent locations in the original sample. Uh, and they have associated with them, these pixels, a numerical value um, for each combination, for each channel and Z plane. So right now we're in channel number four, Z plane number six. I'm at this particular pixel location, which if you look up there, you'll see the coordinates in X and Y and Z. And then you can see it says value on here on the side. And if I zoom out really quickly, you can see that if I'm not in the nucleus, that value is low. You can see it says 10. But if I'm in the nucleus, that value is higher. And in this particular pixel, it's 472. So for every pixel in a single Z plane, that has a certain intensity value. And so what are these intensity values? So these intensity values uh, are a number proportional to how much light came from the location represented by that pixel. Okay, so larger numbers, eventually, if you work through uh, where the light is coming from, they mean a higher concentration of the fluorophore uh, or a higher intensity of laser that hit the fluorophore. And ultimately, they're connected to the stuff that the fluorophore was labeling. So for example, this fluorophore that was in this channel is DAPI. Um, and um, a high number means there was a lot of uh, photons that came from the DAPI at that location. And presumably, that's because there was a lot of DAPI at that location, or at least relative to other locations, there was more. And the reason is there was probably more uh, DNA that the DAPI was binding to. Um, so who cares about everything I just said? So, so the reason this is important is that those numbers are the data. But the computer, as you can see, it's not showing you a matrix of numbers like an Excel spreadsheet. It's showing you something that we can, you know, as humans, identify as an image. Uh, but the computer, to be able to show that to you, needs to make a bunch of decisions. And the decisions are codified here in, in, in the brightness and contrast and in the, in the channels menu. So the idea behind what the computer does is it takes those numbers, and then in each pixel, depending on the number, it shows you some color. And so what it has is literally something called a lookup table, where it has a list of the numbers. And for each number, it has associated with it a color. And so if you're on the grayscale scale, uh, those colors are, they go from black for numbers that are very low, like near here, through a grayscale and up all the way until white for numbers that are very bright. Um, if you were on the sort of color scale, we had assigned cyan, so it goes from sort of black, dark, I guess, cyan, until like really bright uh, cyan if a, if a number is large. So, so then to, to recap, the image is a bunch of numbers. The numbers uh, are related to how much light came from each location represented by the pixel in the sample. And these numbers have to get converted into a little colored square. And so the channels part tells you kind of tells the software which kinds of colors it can convert it to. And there are other places in the software where you can do that as well. And then which numbers to convert into which colors 
is codified by the stuff that you see here. So you can see that it says on one end zero and on the other 684 and there's a histogram and a curve. So the idea is this histogram represents um, the distribution of pixels with various intensities that go from zero to 684. So you can see in this image, most of the pixels have a very low intensity. And that's because most of the pixels are dark. There, you know, there aren't many nuclei in this image. So most of the image is actually dark. Uh, but there are some pixels that clearly have um, higher intensities. Um, now we can't see them because this peak is so big compared to them. Okay, but so how do we adjust how this looks? So the way we can adjust it is we are going to use the minimum and the maximum sliders. So these two, we don't want to use brightness and contrast. These are more useful for bright field images, not for fluorescence. So we're just going to completely ignore those two. And then one other important thing that we're going to avoid doing is pressing the apply button. So this button uh, you should never press because what it does is if you hit apply, the software will overwrite the data with whatever you have adjusted for the display. Um, so you never want to do that. In fact, in my opinion, this, this button should probably have some sort of lock on it because it's something that you almost never want to do. Uh, and certainly never if you're, um, if you're doing uh, kind of fluorescence microscopy and trying to extract quantitative information. So this, forget it, because this will embed whatever adjustments you do in, the, in your display into the data itself. So we don't want to hit apply. Um, but we are going to manipulate these things uh, to get an image of uh, the contrast that we want. And so how do we do that? So if we grab this maximum slider and move it to the left, you can see a couple of things will happen at the same time. One is that this number will get smaller. The second thing is that these nuclei get brighter. And they get so bright, in fact, that they get sort of blown out and we can't see much detail. So why is that? So the reason is... Uh, when I told you that there's a lookup table where the numbers in the individual pixels get assigned to a color, the lowest, so the lowest color, so the darkest color under the current circumstances being assigned, assigned to zero, and the brightest color, so the brightest cyan in this case, is being assigned to 390. And everything in the middle is being scaled linearly by this curve, meaning if you move up a little bit, the cyanness of what you see moves up a little bit. If you move up a little bit more, this, the, the cyan intensity moves up a little bit more, and so on, until it gets to 390. That's the maximum cyan intensity. Beyond that, everything uh, that is at 390 or above will look the brightest possible cyan, which is why when I, when I move this to the left, I eventually see blobs of just pure cyan, because that means that all the pixels in those areas have an intensity of 211 or more. And because um, the curve is sort of anchored at, at the moment, zero, when I move this to the left, I am also automatically increasing the cyan intensity of everybody between zero and 185. So the other thing that you can see is um, over here, where there's really nothing, uh, there's a little bit of, of, of sort of speckling and noise from the detector. But if we're sure that there's no biological material or nothing of interest in that area, one of the things we could do is increase the minimum until that is completely dark. Now, we don't want to go too far because then we'll be chopping off signal of things that are real inside the nuclei, but we can increase that just a little bit from zero and just make this a little bit darker because now what we're doing is we're telling it um, intensities of numbers uh, excuse me, intensities at 26 or below um, should be the darkest color, which is black. And then we scale linearly from 26 to, in this case, 356, which represents the brightest cyan. So with these kinds of adjustments, you can tweak how an image looks. And you can do that for each channel. So this one was easy. And maybe you know I overshot. I would say something like this would be more reasonable. Uh, but then we have you know, something like this. This looks a little bit dim. and We can adjust it. Maybe that gives us a better representation of what's going on. And you can see that this process is a little bit subjective. Uh, and so I frequently quest get questions about, well, how do I do this properly? And um, you know, there are multiple answers to this question. One is you should be kind of honest about what's in the image and not hide things. So for example, you know, if, you, if you do this and make it seem like this is very punctate, that's very misleading because you know, the image shouldn't look dramatically different to what it looks like in, in if you just change the maximum minimum 
a little bit. Um, the other thing that can be really useful is to use a control as a benchmark. So, you know, if you have things like this, and those are also present in a negative control, well, then maybe it's appropriate to increase this, because really this is sort of non-specific because it's in a negative control that's maybe autofluorescence or something like that. That's not the case here, but you could imagine making the case that it was uh, and increasing it to something like that. So I don't think that's the case here. So I'm going to set it maybe there. I'm happy with how that looks. On the other end, be careful of not sort of saturating things uh, like this. Uh, you're not doing anything bad to the data itself, but you are kind of hindering the representation of the data. And if you're interested in sort of little puncta, like sort of stuff that's here, one of the problems with increasing the maximum is that those tend to fuse and become bigger blobs. So, so you really, even if you just care about kind of making morphological statements uh, about the data, you know, going a little overboard with, with these adjustments can make it hard um, and, and obscure what's really going on. All right, so now I'm going to go to channel two uh, and adjust the maximum and the minimum again. So that looks roughly appropriate. And then I'm going to go to channel one. And uh, these are really just speckles. Uh, of, I think these were some sort of DNA transfection, if I recall correctly. Um, so they're really just dots uh, in different Z planes, which you can see as I move this Z slider here. OK, so, so let's say that um, you know, I'm happy with these adjustments uh, at an individual channel level when I look at them one at a time. Uh, it's worth taking a look and seeing if, if I want to eventually show people a composite image. And again, uh, we're in sort of this transition time in Fiji where um, uh, the developers have been kind of mucking around with this composite. So just if, if, you're, if when you look at this video and are trying to do it, um, find this sort of mix uh, of options, just use the composite sum. So you can see uh, if you do that, um, you, you can check whether in, in this composite mode, whether you like the images. So if you look at this, you might think, well, that's a little too bright. Maybe I should dial it down uh, in one of the channels. And so you can go to whichever channel you want. And here you kind of have to keep track um, by you know clicking here, which channel you're on. And this gives you a visual cue. Well, maybe the violet shouldn't be as bright or maybe the yellow shouldn't be as bright, and maybe that gives you the ability to sort of see a little bit in more detail what might be going on here, okay? Now, um, an, important, uh, an important point is that these images um, so far aren't something that you can easily put in a PowerPoint presentation or in a keynote presentation or in whatever software you use to present or in a Word document, if you're writing a, uh, you know, your, uh, some sort of paper or report, or, or even just as a standalone image. Because if you double click on this with it just in, in, in a normal computer that doesn't have specialized imaging software, the computer's not gonna know really what to do with this. So you, you need to take this image, which is just a representation of raw data that we fiddled with, but we haven't, because we haven't pressed apply, we really haven't changed the data in any way. We've just changed how it looks. Um, we need to take this data and convert it to a format uh, where it's going to look exactly how it looks on this screen if you give it to a colleague or put it in a presentation. And so the way we can do that is by going to the, so clicking here, so it's selecting this window, going to this image menu and going to type RGB color. If we do that, uh, it's going to first prompt us when we have multidimensional images whether we want to keep the source, which we do, and whether we want to create an RGB image with all the slices, and the answer here is we don't, and say OK. And so now it created this, which you can see is an RGB image uh, that's just one megabyte, and it's just this slice. And, and this is not an image you would use for analysis because the, the channels have been, so you know we have the data in cyan, magenta, and yellow. Um, and this has been converted to an RGB. So this is just something that is just for display and nothing else, not for analysis. Um, but it's really useful because if I save this image and then I double click on it with just like the Windows Explorer or the Mac Preview or whatever, it's gonna show up exactly like this. So let me show you that. So if I save this as a TIFF and I save it, uh, I'll call it image one RGB. If we now go to that image, uh, and if I double click on it, 
the Windows Explorer shows it exactly um, how it was displayed in Fiji. Okay, so this is very useful. So um, one other thing that's quite useful um, is, uh, and, and I would argue uh, necessary, uh, is to add a scale bar to this image. Okay, because whenever you're showing a microscopy image, you know, what's this? Is it a micron? Is it three microns? Uh, we, you know, whenever you have a microscopy image, uh, there has to be a, at least one scale bar and a set of images that are related to each other so people can you know, figure out how big things are. So how, how do you add a scale bar uh, to this image? Uh, so the way you can do that is uh, in Fiji, uh, there's a tool called scale bar. And uh, I don't quite remember where that tool is. And so Fiji has a really nice option for searching for commands. So if you remember uh, the name of something or you, you have a clue as to what the name of something might be, um, you can search for that command. So if I click here on the search bar and you can also press the letter L and that will automatically pop you in there. If I uh, type scale bar, you can see there's a bunch of things that are related to scale and there's something called scale bar in analyze tools scale bar so that means that it's here analyze tools scale bar so i could run it from there or i could double click here or i could click run and this runs the scale bar dialog box and so this has a number of useful options you can make it wider or or shorter and it's like 11 microns is not a very uh, typical option but maybe you want to make it 10 microns or Maybe you want to make it 20 microns. Uh, let's say 10, you could make it thicker. So for example, that would be twice as thick. Um, um, sorry, this is uh, incorrect. Um, this is if you made it vertical. Um, the, the actual thickness of the bar is here, the thickness in pixels. And then the font size, you can make it you know, smaller, bigger, uh, you could also uh, remove the font. Uh, that's usually uh, journals don't like it if you have the font. So uh, if you have the, the text, so you can remove it. You can change the kind of font, you know, serifs or not. You can make it bold or not. Um, you can put it in different locations. So you have a lot of, uh, you know, different options. Once you say OK, uh, if you like this, you can save this image. So I'm going to do Control S. Uh, actually, let me do save as and i'm going to call it rgb scale bar say save and so now if i go um here and double click this will the scale bar appear so if you see here the scale bar didn't appear and so this may happen to you as well and so if that happens it's because the scale bar hasn't been sort of burned into the image it's just an object floating in it that uh image j can interpret uh but uh, the Windows uh, viewer can't. So if you want to burn it in to the to this image, um, you can do that uh, using a command called flatten. And and that one I honestly never have a clue where it is. But if we type flatten here, uh, you can see it's an image overlay flatten. So if you say run, it creates a new image where that has been burned in. And you can actually tell that that's the case because if you zoom in here, this looks like kind of an object. But if you zoom in here, this looks like pixels. So this is now kind of part of the image. And if I save this, and I call it SB flatten, oops, excuse me. If I now double click on that with the Windows Explorer, now you can see uh, that it's nicely present in the image. Okay, and so you could imagine, uh, you know, doing something like having this image and then, you know, typically when you have multiple channels, you sometimes have constituent images. So you could say, well, uh, I'd like this as well. So you would have that one. Uh, oops, excuse me. So we'll go back to this one channel and say type RGB color. You could have that one and you could have this one. And so you could save these different images. So let me actually just save them as they are. And then you could imagine, I don't know, opening something like PowerPoint. If I 
I don't want to give PowerPoint any feedback right now. And so you could say, well, insert pictures from this device, and I will go, uh, let's see, here. Okay, I've got pictures of various, my daughter, Harry Potter characters that are uh, some of the names of our microscopes. All right, here we go. Okay, and so you could imagine having the different channels like this. Evidently, I've copied them over somehow. All right, but you can imagine making something like this, which is sort of a typical figure. And so now, uh, if you wanted to make something like this, you, you really just have all the tools you need, um, you know, to, to, to make this kind of uh, this kind of image. Um, so let me close this or minimize it. So, so there's a few other things that, that are important um, as you do this. Um, one of which is, let's say, you know, you typically don't show a single image. And by a single image, I don't mean the channels. I mean, you don't just show an image from one condition. You typically compare across conditions. And so if you want to do that, how do you do that? And so let, let me show you how you do that. So I'm going to uh, close these things here, um, just leaving this initial image. And I'm going to now open um, all of the other images, which I'm going to do shift click and drag this into Fiji. For each one, I'm going to get this. I'm going to say, OK, 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 and OK. Oh, and I have one more, okay. All right, so when you have multiple images, let's say you have multiple images and you wanna get a feel for the different images. So uh, there's a few kind of useful things you can do. First, if you go to Window Tile, uh, that does exactly what it sounds like. It just puts them in a configuration where they're all tiled together. The other thing you may wanna do is sort of synchronize them so that when you change things in one image, it changes in all the others. So there's a command again that I, I never remember where this is, but it's called Synchronize Windows. It's in Analyze Tools, um, so Analyze Tools, Synchronize Windows. So if you run that and you say Synchronize All, now you can see when I hover on one, I can see where I am on the others. But if I move um, this, I'm in the same channel in the same z-plane on all of them. Now, the same z-plane when you take z-stacks may or may not be a good idea because Maybe they don't have the same number of Z positions and maybe the cells aren't centered in each one, but it's sort of close enough to get an idea um, of what might be going on here. Uh, now, unfortunately, the, the channels tool, if you, if, you, um, if you change this stuff, that gets coordinated between them. But if you change this stuff, so like if you use, you know, if you make all of them grayscale or all of them color, uh, which is something you might want to do. It only actually does the one that you've last clicked on. So if I go here and switch this one to color, it'll only do that one. And you can see, in fact, that in addition to only doing it one one at a time, it doesn't propagate all the, the, the coloring decisions made here to all of them, um, which could be a bit annoying when you're doing this. So you could write a little macro that would do that. I'm not going to cover that in, in, in this, but um, if not, you're sort of stuck doing it one at a time. So I'm going to switch to grayscale, and the reason I'm going to switch to grayscale is uh, I, I personally find it a little bit easier to understand what's going on um, uh, because the human eye is pretty good at telling apart uh, something that's a little bit whiter from something that's a little bit darker gray, whereas uh, the human eye, or at least my human eye, is really bad at seeing whether a, a, little, a, a certain yellow is brighter than another yellow or a blue is deeper than another blue. So the grayscale, you know, if, you, if you're not sure, it's a pretty good uh, default when you're looking at things, a kind of a pretty safe default. So, so now, you know, you may ask yourself, so, so natural questions that come up when you're comparing multiple images is, 
hey, this looks really bright. Is that actually brighter than this? That Does that mean that the particular protein in this case, which we were labeling here, is brighter in image one that maybe came from a different condition than image two and three? Um, how do we tell? So to be able to make those comparisons, all of your images have to have been, uh, have to have come from samples that you know were prepared at the same time with uh, the same method. And they um, must also have come from samples that were imaged at the same time with the same settings because if that's not true then something might be brighter just because maybe the laser was brighter uh, in the particular setting used on that day or even if you used exactly the same settings if you come to a microscope you know three weeks after you did uh, your first batch uh, of imaging uh, it might be the case that uh, your samples the fluorescence has faded so some of the fluorophores have degraded or the laser is, you know, 10% brighter or 10% dimmer. Um, there's a certain amount of fluctuation in the in the hardware, and so you you know that's not super reliable. But if you let's say you took all these images at the same time uh, with the same settings, so for us to be able to uh, make statements about whether this is actually brighter than that without measuring just visually, the final piece of the puzzle is we need all of the images to be displayed with the same settings. And this is something that gets a little bit confusing, but all of the adjustments that we made uh, some time ago on this particular image um, with maximum and minimum, those were only made to this particular image. And they didn't change the data. So by this particular image, I mean the one on the top left. And they didn't change the data. Uh, they just changed how it looks. But to compare it to the other ones, we need all of them to have, have the same adjustments. Uh, and when you open something in Fiji, it will auto scale them. Um, if you, I don't know if you noticed, but that was the one uh, option that was engaged uh, when we drag things in with the, that bio formats importer. And so it just sort of auto scales the display so that it looks you know good under some Fiji definition of good, which is usually a, a good guess. Um, and so, if we want everything to look like this, we need to tell Fiji to do that. And so I'm gonna show you now how to tell Fiji how to do that. And the way to do that is you go to the image that you want as your sort of seed image, the one that whose settings you wanna propagate across everyone else. And then you go here and again, never hit apply, but you hit set. And within set, uh, this is a way where you can for each channel, instead of using the sliders, put individual numbers in. Um, but the, 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 this, this set display range has a very useful thing in it called propagate to all other, in this case, four channel images, but this will say just the number of channels. And so if you click this and say, okay, what's going to happen is all the display settings from this image will get propagated to all the other images. So if I say, okay, so now we've got this. So you can see everybody's bright. So it's not that this one was brighter. It's just that we had adjusted it so that it looked brighter. Um, and in fact, you can see that they're all sort of similar. And you can say, well, but you know, now this one's too bright. Okay, so if this one looks too bright, we could adjust things here. And one way of just starting the adjustment again is we can just say reset. That takes it back to actually what it does is it takes it back to the maximum. So this is actually the maximum intensity that's in here. And it's making that maximum intensity white, which is sort of one option that, that's a reasonable starting point. Let's say we wanna make it look a little brighter. And then we say set propagate to all other four channel images. And now all of them are adjusted like this one. So you can see that these, uh, the sort of middle bottom and um, middle left, uh, and sorry, bottom left, those have some speckles that are brighter than in the other ones. And that's truly brighter because we acquired the, I, can, I, I know that these were prepared the same um, and acquired with the same settings. And so because they are now in the same display settings, this is actually brighter than this. And so if you had a situation where uh, you know, the top right, bottom left, and middle left, and um, excuse me, top right, bottom left, and middle bottom were a particular condition, and the other three were a different condition, this would might give you a clue that in, in, in one condition, you've got more speckles and they are brighter. Uh, whereas if you just adjust this individually for each image, uh, there would be no way of making that comparison because you, you know, you just made random adjustments to each one. Um, so this is something useful to keep in mind. Now, if you want to somehow um, kind of export uh, 
images uh, w w having made these same adjustments, again, you can use this image type RGB color um, and export those as needed. Um, so uh, I hope that's that's a useful introduction to just barely scraping the surface of Fiji, but, but at least now you know how to make adjustments, how to make adjustments across multiple images, how to add a scale bar, how to sear it into the image so that it's, it, it's part of the image, um, and how to export things in a way that you can then display them reliably um, just in sort of regular word processing or presentation uh, things. So uh, one final uh, Zeiss specific uh, thing is, that, so for those of you that are using um, images that come from Zeiss confocals, um, it's actually very useful to have the the uh, the Zeiss uh, Zen Light software on your computer. So that's free. You can get it. You know, you just Google uh, Zeiss Zen Light, and you know, you just need to fill out some stuff with Zeiss, and they'll send it to you for free. Something that's uh, actually very confusing is that Zen Light is actually two pieces of software called Zen Black and Zen Blue. Uh, so Zen Black is uh, more similar to the software uh, that's present on uh, laser scanning confocals, particularly models of the sort of 700 series. Uh, and it's, it's quite limited, the software, the Zen Light Black. And then Zen Blue is a little bit more powerful. Uh, and it's more similar to software on Zeiss's wide fields and the more modern confocals. And so the reason you want them is, I'm not going to go into how to use each of these, but there's one reason that you really want these two pieces of software uh, on your system, which is um, they allow you to more easily read the metadata of how the images uh, were created. And this is something that you're going to need to use uh, when, you're, um, when you're writing your materials and methods. So let me just show you that very briefly. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not going to go into how to use uh, Zen Light, um, but um, let me show you where you get the metadata and just point out that uh, for reasons that I, I really don't understand, uh, you kind of need both because the metadata that each of these versions reads, even though it's sort of Zeiss images, they don't read. They don't each read all of the metadata correctly, and so you kind of need both to to figure out uh, what's going on. So, for example, if I open, let's say, image one, this is uh, Zen Blue, and then I open image one in Zen Black. If you go um, um, here to Info, you will see a bunch of information here. This 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 file in particular doesn't have a lot of information because uh, there's there's a little bit of a white lie that it, this image was not originally a .czi. It was a .lsm, and I converted it for reasons that don't matter right now, and so we lost some of the information, but Typically, you see um, a bunch of information here uh, that's very useful, particularly in terms of like what filters you have. Uh, and then you uh, in, in Zen Blue, you have some other information, but this doesn't have usually good information about filters, but it does have the information, for example, about the pinhole, which can be useful to know. And uh, just, you know, uh, just believe me when I tell you that uh, in, the, in the Zen Black, this will be populated if the image uh, actually was created as a ZZI on the microscope. That's for reasons that don't matter. Like that's not the way I did it today. Um, so that's where you get stuff. And if you, you know, if, if you're at that point of, of, of writing your paper and you want to do a proper materials and methods, you're going to need that information. And I have on our uh, website uh, in our rigor and reproducibility section, uh, a long um, explanation of what it is that you need to report in materials and methods. Uh, and finally, if you find any of this useful, and particularly if you use the microscopes in our core, which are grant-supported, uh, please acknowledge us. That really does help with funding, uh, and that's also on our website. And you know, here uh, it explains how to acknowledge the grants that that pay um, for for equipment uh, in some cases, and for part of our salaries and the service contracts that make sure that that equipment uh, you know remains in good standing uh, so that you can use it. So uh, as usual, if you have questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I hope this was useful and answers some basic questions uh, that you might have on how to use Fiji to uh, 
adjust the display of your images and to create things that you can embed in presentations or in other documents.